and you could hear those bombs coming in. It sounded like a bunch of children screaming. We were encircled by the Germans, fighting for our lives. My name's William Pallatti. I was born in the little town of Waynesburg. But at the age of six, we moved to a little town of Negley, Ohio, about four or 500 people. My father got a job over there when the brickyard in Waynesburg quit during the Depression years. He got a job for a dollar a day digging coal. Can you imagine that, a dollar a day? Then he got a job on a railroad for 30 cents an hour, which is 240 a day. He thought he was a rich man. So that lasted for a while. But you know, I always had everything I needed and wanted, food and clothing, no problem. Ruth was my girlfriend at the time. Actually, we met in the fifth and sixth grade. She came to town as a fifth grader and I was in the sixth grade. But then we started dating in high school. I graduated in May of 1943 and got drafted in November of 43. So. I didn't have a chance to do much after high school days. And when I got drafted, I went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma for basic training. It's a field artillery replacement training center. So they were training us for, uh, of course, combat and uh, training with tanks and half tracks and preparing you for anything that could take place during the war. At that time, I got shipped to uh, Camp Campbell, Kentucky. And that's where I was assigned to the 275th Armored Field Artillery Battalion, B Battery. I was in the ammunition section and rode in the half tracks. We kept the tanks supplied with ammunition. In August of 1944, the 275th deployed to the shores of France only weeks after D-Day, the unprecedented Allied invasion of Normandy. Though the fighting on the beaches had long since ceased, Bill was overwhelmed by the sheer scope of the operation and the apparent undaunted will to achieve the victory. When we crossed the English Channel, we landed at Utah Beach. I just couldn't believe how we ever won that war, having to ship everything over to the battle sites over there. When you stop to think of all the airplanes, the tanks, the trucks, the jeeps, you name it, how could we ever have done that successfully? But we did. And those poor boys didn't have a chance, but they pulled it off. They pulled it off. Just unbelievable that we were able to be victorious. And uh, we worked our way up through southern France. There was still a little bit of fighting going on in some of the small towns and hedgerows. And uh, after going up through France, we went up into Luxembourg and Holland, and we ended up in Belgium, up in the German-Belgian border, up in the Ardennes. We were, our guns were firing away at the Siegfried Line. We were actually in, they called it combat, but at that point, I had never even seen an enemy. Uh, just firing at the pillboxes and what have you, because we were told we were gonna stay there for all winter long and uh, prepare for a uh, spring offensive. But that never came about since the Germans started their winter offensive started in December 16. Although the Allied forces had spent the past five months steadily pursuing the German army across Western Europe, their offensive was abruptly halted when Adolf Hitler unleashed a surprising attack of his own. In a desperate onslaught of every German soldier and machine available, the Allied lines were broken, resulting in the brutal, relentless Battle of the Bulge. At that time, we were attached to the 106th Infantry Division, and they were only young boys, 18, 19 years old, like a lot of us were at the time. 
And they had only been out of the States for about two weeks and put right up into the front lines, no battle experience at all. A lot of them didn't even have enough ammunition for their guns. And that's where the Germans broke through. And for a couple days, uh, it was very, very hectic. Everyone was confused. They lost their outfits. They were just staggering here and there. And, and it was so cold. It was anywhere between zero and five below, probably close to a foot of snow on the ground. A lot of the troops didn't even have sufficient clothing. Some of those poor troops, uh, I can't imagine what they went through, especially the infantry. Those poor boys, uh, it just boggles my mind what they had to do, because they, they really got into a lot of hand-to-hand -hand fighting. I know in many cases that infantry would jump on our tanks and we would take them up to the front lines and then we would shoot over their heads. And uh, my gosh, those poor boys, they, they, they went through hell, went through hell. At the outbreak of the bulge, Bill and the 275th would find themselves in the middle of a crucial battle that would have a major impact on the outcome of the surprise German offensive. Well, the significance of the Battle of St. Vith was that the Germans wanted to get to Liège and Antwerp to stop all of our supplies. That's where all of our supplies are coming in from. However, St. Vith was a bitter battle. The Germans took it, we took it back, then the Germans got it again. The German commander's view of the importance of St. Vith was three things had to happen for the Germans. The German attack had to be a surprise, which it was, definitely. The weather to be such as to prevent strikes by Allied aircraft so the German columns could come through the Ardennes, that certainly was in their favor. The third one was the progress of the German main effort through and beyond St. Vith without any delays. Well, that one they did not meet because as I said earlier, the battle at St. Vith went back and forth several times. So those things did not happen in their favor. Though the Battle of St. Vith proved an American defeat, their brave resilience resulted in a major disruption of the German objective. The time wasted at St. Vith prevented a larger encirclement of Allied forces and ensured the continual flow of American supply lines and the eventual reinforcement of American troops. But there was a lot of fighting going on in Bastogne, Malmody, St. Vith, Hinderhausen. Many, many bitter battles were fought there, and sometimes direct tank fire. And you could hear those bombs coming in. It sounded like a bunch of children screaming uh, when their 88 shells were coming in, especially up in the Ardennes forest. Uh, you could hear them coming in, and all the trees were, a lot of them were just flattened. We were so young that sometimes we hardly even realized what was going on, but actually we were fighting for our lives and uh, many, many times the Germans were so close to us. And during the bulge, at one time, right around Christmas time, we were kind of uh, the hole in a donut. We were encircled by the Germans. And it was so foggy that our planes couldn't fly. We were running out of supplies. And I think about the 27th or 28th of December, the fog did lift and all the airplanes, the bombers and all the airplanes that are dropping supplies. And that, that was a turning point for us. Fortunately, we found a way out and uh, my gosh, it was just, I, I can't tell you how happy we're, we were to get out of that mess. By the 25th of January, 1945, the resilient Allied forces finally emerged from the Battle of the Bulge, victorious. The subsequent push toward Germany saw the Allies advancing faster than ever before. After the Bulge, we continued on towards Germany, crossed the Ruhr River. We crossed the Rhine River in March of 45. And uh, once we crossed the Rhine River, uh, we would pull into positions and our guns would be ready to fire. 
And shortly thereafter, the Germans were surrendering in mass groves and also retreating. So our guns had to be moved again, moved forward and set up again. But we were, at that time, we were taking many, many prisoners. There was still a lot of fighting going on, but not to the extent that it was during the Battle of the Bulge. They were retreating and surrendering so rapidly that we couldn't hardly keep up with them. The people, it, it was so sad when we would pull into these little towns. The people were just leaving their homes uh, with their children. A lot of times kids were crying. People were pulling a little cart with wooden wheels on it and uh, a sack over their back with their belongings going in the opposite direction of where the fighting was going on. It was just so sad to see that. If you can imagine something like that going on in our own country. Throughout the world, throngs of people hail the end of the war in Europe. It is five years and more since Hitler marched into Poland. Years full of suffering and death and sacrifice. Now the war against Germany is won. We were up on the front lines yet when we got the word. Oh my gosh, everybody was so happy at the time. I think we just dropped our guns and started hugging each other. And it was a special moment and know that finally we were able to just realize what we'd gone through and fortunately for a lot of us it's unfortunate how many people were lost and uh, how many soldiers were lost in the Battle of the Bulge and it was it was thousands how many German casualties and En enormous figures, so sad. Because really those people didn't want to fight any more than we did. It was their leader, Hitler. We got shipped down to France again, southern France, to a camp called Lucky Strike. We got on a uh, ship called the Santa Maria and came back to the States and we landed at Camp Miles Standish in Boston. It was so, I, I just don't know how to describe the, the joy that it was to come back and know that the war was over. Ruth was going to the Youngstown Hospital School of Nursing under the cadet program. And when it come time for us to get discharged, uh, Rene Campbell, who was an instructor at the Youngstown School of Nursing. She made arrangements for Ruth, who was just a student, to get some time off and meet us at the station, railroad station in uh, Youngstown. I kind of tear up sometimes at some of these memories, so forgive me. She waited for me. We got married in December 1947 and had five sons, five wonderful sons, and five daughters in law. And uh, I have nine grandchildren, four great-grandchildren, and two great-great-grandchildren in Alabama. So, yeah, life, life is good. Life is good. And I'm still here at 96 years old. I, I thank God every morning and every night for another day. I'm Josh from Memoirs of World War II, and I just want to say thank you for watching this episode. Our goal is to capture as many World War II veteran stories as we can from all over the world, but we can't do it alone. If you'd like to help us in this mission, consider supporting us through Patreon and check out our website, memoirsofworldwar2.com, for more information. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. 
Again, we want to thank you for your support and thanks for watching.